Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us for the Celebrate Learning Week keynote. Uh, we're happy to have you join us. We will get started shortly as more people come in. But right now, I just want to bring your attention to the image we have on screen. We have an image of university students walking outdoors with today's session title of the keynote with Dr. Timothy Cordes on the hurdle and the highway, how we think about inclusion, accommodation, and disability and why it matters. We'll get started shortly in about one minute. Thank you for your patience. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, our keynote talk for Celebrate Learning Week 2022. The Hurdle and the Highway, How We Think About Inclusion, Accommodation, and Disability, and Why It Matters, with Timothy Cordes. The 13th annual Celebrate Learning Week, I can't believe it's 13 years already, is sponsored by the Office of the Provost and VP Academic. And for a second year, it is taking place on both campuses through uh, the medium of online. Um, so it's sponsored by Provost offices on both campuses. My name is Christina Hendricks. I'm the uh, Academic Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology at UBC Vancouver, and also a Professor of Teaching in the Philosophy Department. I want to begin by acknowledging that I am joining you from the campus of the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, which is located on the traditional and un unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Some of you may be joining from UBC Okanagan, which is on the traditional territory of the Silks Okanagan people. Now in previous years, Celebrate Learning Week has um, been held, well, previous to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been held in person and uh, we have all been located in one place where we acknowledge that place where we are located. And perhaps it's easier to do a land acknowledgement in that uh, situation, but it's no less important when we're meeting uh, online. And it's not as if we're online like in the ether, right? We're, we're each in various spaces. We're coming uh, here grounded in a space. Um, and many of us are doing so from British Columbia. And if so, many places are on unceded traditional territory of indigenous peoples. So for those of us who are guests on these lands, um, I often try to think about how can I act as a good guest and contribute to decolonization and reconciliation. One way is to start learning more about the lands, the people, the culture, and the history of the places where we are living, working, and playing. And many indigenous nations have websites that provide really useful information about their lands and cultures and histories. So for example, at UBC Vancouver, the Musqueam Nation has a website with some educational resources that talks about um, uh, their culture, their language, their history, their territory, their stories. It's really a wonderful set of educational resources that you can review yourself and also use in teaching and learning. And in Okanagan, the Sioux Okanagan Nation website also has information about their language, culture, and history. So those are good places to, to start if you're, if you're located on those lands. And for those of us at UBC, we can also learn about the Memorandum of Affiliation with the Musqueam Nation in UBC and the Memorandum of Understanding with the Sioux Okanagan Nation which guide UBC's relationships with these nations. Um, and I think it's useful for us to recognize the agreements that, have, uh, that do exist and guide our work within the communities um, of the First Nations people. As we learned today about accessibility and inclusion, let's also keep in mind that the institutional structures and practices we're working to have people be included in have been built upon colonial uh, practices and values. And that UBC is working and has made strong commitments through these memoranda and through the Indigenous Strategic Plan to uh, um, uphold Indigenous human rights, to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions and to work in partnership with local communities towards reconciliation. So I encourage all of us at UBC to take a look at the Indigenous Strategic Plan, which provides a really clear framework for um, locating 
really everybody's work um, within the, the strategic plan and supporting indigenous human rights. There's also fantastic toolkits that you can take a look at to help you get started with the indigenous strategic plan. So talking then about Celebrate Learning Week in particular, this is an opportunity for us to recognize all of the hard work and talent and teaching and learning commitments and achievements at UBC. Throughout this whole week, we've got uh, events uh, from UBC folks in Vancouver, UBC folks in Okanagan and others. And uh, we're working together across campuses to host a series of in-person and online events. The theme of this year's Celebrate Learning Week is promoting inclusivity and accessibility. We've got over 35 events that highlight accessibility for people with disabilities, along with inclusive learning, living and working environments for students, faculty and staff. So we've got a full list of events um, at celebratelearning.ubc.ca. So talking about some practical things about the session today. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. So we invite you to participate in the session, um, however makes most sense to you with your camera on or off. Sit down, stand up, walk around, um, have a snack, have a pet beside you, whatever works for you. Please keep your microphone off when you're not speaking. There will be a chance to, to speak on the microphone if you wish later during the Q&A. Please note that the session is being recorded and it will be uh, shared afterwards as a resource on the Celebrate Learning Wiki. If you do not wish to have your uh, voice or video recorded, please keep both of those off. The chat will not be recorded. The event has a live captioner. You can enable this feature by clicking on the CC button on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, and we also have two uh, American Sign Language interpreters joining us today. So thank you very much to all of, of those folks for uh, their assistance during the session. We've enabled, we have disabled the general Zoom chat for this event because our keynote speaker is, is unable to attend to the chat while also doing the, the talk and we want to limit distractions for him. So you can still engage in the session through Zoom reactions um, at the bottom of your screen. You can use the private message Zoom chat if you're having any technical difficulties. So Rachel um, Lee is our tech support. And if you're having uh, problems, please connect with Rachel Lee through the Zoom chat. Later in the session, there'll be time for questions and there will be several ways to engage. So during the presentation, um, we have an opportunity for you to post questions using uh, an online site called Slido. You do not need to have an account. You can just go to the website and type in your question. On the slide now is a community agreement slide that has uh, several words on it that I'm just going to de describe. So to ensure an open, inclusive and respectful dialogue and participation, we'd like to start by recognizing this space as a, a place of learning for all of us. And we'd like to share with you a community agreement, which describes a set of guidelines that help to set our intentions for how we'll work together today. So starting at the top right, we would like us all to acknowledge that this is a space of learning. So learning uh, from and with each other. Next, we'd like to acknowledge that discussions regarding diversity, inclusion, and discrimination can sometimes raise strong emotions. They can sometimes be uncomfortable. They can be felt, these emotions can be felt quite differently by different people for various reasons. For those um, who are sharing lived experience of, uh, of discrimination or other harms, um, or, or for whom this might bring up those experiences, um, I hope we receive their discomfort with care. And for those who have not lived that experience, um, hope we can le lean into discomfort and use it to guide our growth. So that's the third note. The third uh, word is recognition, recognizing that discomfort and recognizing these emotions and working with them to support our learning. So, uh, next word is impact. We ask that you listen to each other's perspectives and that you be accountable for the impact of our words, even when this is different from our intentions. And lastly, responsibility. 
we recognize that we're all responsible for equitable, generative, and respectful dialogue. And facilitators in this session, including myself, our Q&A facilitators, who you will meet later, and our, um, our keynote speaker, supports uh, this goal of responsibility for equity. So please join us in helping to set the space for a generative and respectful dialogue as you engage with the session today. And finally, now we'll be able to introduce our keynote speaker, Timothy Cordes. Um, we're excited to welcome Dr. Timothy Cordes, who's joined us this year for the Celebrate Teaching Week, uh, Celebrate uh, Learning Week keynote address. Um, uh, Dr. Cordes is a blind person who graduated as valedictorian from the University of Notre Dame. He went on to earn a PhD in biomolecular bio chemistry and an MD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In graduate school, he developed software to de describe protein structures with sound. Dr. Cordes also completed a general psychiatry residency at the University of Wisconsin in 2011 and a fellowship in addiction psychiatry in 2012. He's board certified in both. From 2012 to 2018, he worked for the Veterans Administration. And from 2016 to 2017, he led the Madison uh, Veterans Administration as the medical director for addiction services. He's currently the interim director of the psychiatry department at the University Health Services, which serves students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's presented nationally and internationally on the lessons he's acquired while navigating this path. So I want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Cordes, for joining us. Welcome, and I look forward to your talk. Thanks so much. Uh, it's really great to be here with you guys uh, virtually. I'm on uh, DeJoop land in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. It's about 75 degrees out there today. It looks a little warmer than maybe what you guys have. Um, so I, I'm really thankful. It's really neat that an institution um, focuses on learning and gives it this, you know, this spotlight. Um, and so it's, it's nice to be a part of that. And I'm really glad I was uh, invited. Uh, let me get my uh, slides going here. So disclaimer, I don't have any uh, financial um, conflicts of interest to disclose. I will say I'm an unapologetic advocate for people with disabilities, and that comes through. So I, I don't consider that a conflict. I consider that an interest. Um, these opinions are solely my own. Uh, they don't represent uh, the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, or Point and Click, a software company I, uh, I work for. Um, so yeah, in my background, I've been the student, I've been the graduate student, I've been the researcher, I've been the doctor, I've been the uh, leader of doctors. Um, and so I think that gives me some perspective to, to think about how we think about accommodation. Uh, as a psychiatrist, I know that how we approach things, how we think about them, makes a lot of di difference in our outcomes. So we can talk about that. We can talk about how we recognize our biases and ways to become better learners. Um, I'll give you an example case of, of how this uh, plays out and then move from the hurdle to the, the highway. How do we convey most people uh, safely to the goal of learning uh, with the least impediments uh, and then ideas on how to generalize from there um, and then ultimately we'll begin to to put it all together um, so um, so there should be a, a picture of a hurdle I believe um, um, and so in this notion uh, we think of educational tasks as hurdles that that students or learners overcome on the way to their path of enlightenment or learning or training. Um, and the disability may present uh, additional challenges there. And some students may need extra accommodation to clear the hurdle. Uh, this comes through in our language all the time, overcoming challenges, um, you know, and, and it's it's the default way of how, how we think about it. The, the person with the disability needs to clear the hurdle, which turns out to be perpendicular to the path of learning a, a lot of times uh, as, as uh, a hurdle demonstrates. So how did this really um, present to me? Well, I was about 18. Uh, I was going to study at the University of Notre Dame. And before I set foot in a classroom, I met with all the heads of the departments. Uh, they were showing interest and they sat on one side of a large uh, 
uh, boardroom table. I put my seeing eye dog to rest underneath and I sat on the other side with my parents. Uh, and the head of the biology department slid a book much like this over to my father pointing at a picture much like this um, and said, how is he going to learn this, right? Here's the hurdle, how, how is he going to learn this? Um, and so what was he saying really? He was saying, teach me how I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm a learner, I'm a scholar, teach me. So with non-judgmental curiosity, the teacher can become the student again. Um, so we talked about the tools and techniques of blindness, things, you know, mobility, using braille, um, recorded media. Back in those days, it was um, cassette tapes, uh, which, would, which would be an anachronism uh, today. Um, braille, the ability to make raised line drawings by tracing on paper that exposes a raised line where you drew. And we told them about all those things. And so we helped them uh, learn because they presented some non-judgmental curiosity. Uh, it was gratifying. I, I ran into um, Dr. Duman the next semester on campus, and he said, um, you know, I wonder if I gave all the students dark glasses if they would do as well as you. It, it was a compliment, uh, and I, I thanked him for that. And then he, he told me to go get a haircut because I look like a hippie. Um, I, I appreciated the first more than the latter, but probably got a haircut anyways. Um, so we all have these biases, and this is a common one. Could I clear the hurdle if I, and then you insert yourself into the picture, if I couldn't see, if I had, if I was deaf or I was hard of hearing, if I didn't have full mobility, uh, if I struggled with depression. So we always tend to put ourselves in the center of this question. And it doesn't always happen consciously, but it happens nonetheless. Um, so as a psychiatrist, uh, we have this idea that comes from psychotherapy of the counter transference. And so this is a, comp uh, a construct that encompasses how a therapist feels towards a patient. And often it needs to be brought into conscious awareness. We all see through our own lens. Um, and in order to design or accommodate, we, we have to know what our lens uh, is telling us and how it might be distorting the image. So it's not just the functional disability, it's the perception of the disability. So it's not just what I can do, it's what you think I can do. So this is met in a tongue-in-cheek fashion um, uh, to sort of describe that, that where we stand matters. Um, so let's consider a radio advertisement directed mainly towards people with visual disabilities or people who are blind. Um, so I'm just going to help you out here. Um, so it's, it's a radio ad. You might hear some violins rising gently, and then the voiceover comes on. Just consider that for 12 hours a day, these people are helpless. They're unable to read their books, find their way around their homes, unable even to match their socks. These are the sighted people all around us, and they are in desperate need of light bulbs. Please consider donating to Lighted for the Sighted. Even a few dollars can buy light and safety for these among us. So if you're a blind person, or a person who is blind, that would make sense from where you stand. But to most of you, I imagine, that seemed a little odd. So we really need to stop and re reflect on our personal uh, preconceptions. If we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it, right? So it's worth it every now and then just to pause and see what we're carrying with us. So let's do a quick check. Um, can people with a visual impairment become a successful physician? Yep. I, 
Hard of hearing or deaf, yes. Mobility impairments, yep. Mental health disorders, yes. So all these people can reach the level of physician, which requires significant training, knowledge, and, uh, and education. So the disability may be obvious, uh, but it's only one part of a human's uh, complex identity. So let me give you a, st a story to illustrate this. I was in high school. Uh, I was in the drama club. I had a bit part in a school play. I was a doorman. Uh, and my stage directions called for me to walk to the center of the stage, down a set of steps without a railing, and then exit the theater. Um, we realized the safest way for me to do this was with my seeing eye dog. So I said my lines, you know, good night, Mr. Dennison. And then I walked to center stage with, with my dog. And I, um, and I, took the steps out, it was a normal rehearsal. Um, so the, it all seemed normal to me. Uh, my mom caught me afterwards and she said, you know, I was sitting next to a lady who said, I, um, I thought I'd seen the play before, but I don't remember the dog. So all she saw was the, was the dog. Um, And I just wanted to, to check in. Can I get feedback that I re-engaged my screen after that exercise a couple slides back? Yes, we're seeing the Okay, slide. awesome. Slide all with right. the, what is it, iceberg on Iceberg, it. yep, the slide with the iceberg. Okay, all right. Um, so, so what's beneath the surface, right? Um, the individuals had the opportunity to, to learn skills to handle whatever their situation may be, to develop strategies to compensate, uh, to acquire their own, their own tools, maybe even develop them. Uh, and other strengths may develop because of how the person has grown uh, in the presence or, or absence of, of certain challenges. Uh, the brain itself can adapt. And then all those other things that make us unique individuals happen right that whether that's our ethnicity our gender um, our spirituality wh whatever that is is on top of and connected to all the above um, and those things matter when we when we approach inclusivity when we approach uh, accommodation so so what happens in the brain uh, as a psychiatrist i, I can't help this uh, so there's this thing called neuroplasticity, and this is the ability of the brain to reorganize itself uh, by forming new neural connections throughout life. Now, if you made it to this seminar, your brain made some new connections today. So congratulations. Um, and so neuroplasticity allows the brain to compensate for injury um, or in response to, to new situations. Now, this is this is fascinating. So this is, this is an image uh, of brain activity. And what it's showing is that the occipital cortex, so this is the back of your brain that typically processes visual information, um, incited information uh, in a blind person reading braille, they, they can see the, um, it light up when a blind person reads braille. So other, other things we know is that, um, so you can have uh, braille reading activate visual cortex. You can have auditory cortex activated when folks are lip reading. Um, the way I think about this is the brain is a greedy real estate developer. It's not going to let space go unclaimed or unused if it can help it. Um, and so that gives me a, a sense of wonder there's so much we don't know. So given that, how do, how do we discover, right? So first of all, we start to be aware of our own biases, uh, the lenses we're seeing through. Um, Star, Star Wars quote for any fans out there, unlearn what you have learned, because sometimes the things we've learned get in the way, and sometimes they're just wrong. Um, and then we can use non-judgmental curiosity. How is it for you? 
tell me, you know, try to, to peek into someone else's lived experience. Um, and then we align the goal to teach with their goal to learn. We're, we're both here for the same reason. Um, and so let's, let's put those reasons together and, and get some synergy. Um, and then I call this relocating the uncertainty. So we say to ourselves, well, it will be done. Let's figure out how, instead of spending our time trying to decide if something can be done. I'll give you a perfect example of this. So I was in medical school um, and we have a two week anesthesiology rotation. And one of the, the tasks in that rotation is to put a breathing tube down the throat of, of a patient to, to breathe for them. So I had this wonderful attending uh, physician, his name was George Arndt. And he came in one day and he said, Tim, I know how you're going to intubate a patient. And this is wonderful news to me because I, I didn't have a clue. Um, but he had aligned his goal with mine. Um, and so what did we do? Well, we used this, we used a combination of tools, one of them being this tool called a fast track. So first of all, he figured out uh, how to make a, a extended stethoscope so I could hear the patient's breath sounds while I was standing at the head of the bed, like the anesthesiologist, the, the head of the table, like the anesthesiologist. Uh, and then we found that the CO2 monitors on the anesthesia machines could play tones do, 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 to let you know if your intubation tube was in the right spot. And this is called a fast track. So this is a device that you can put down the airway and, and sort of slide it and slide it back and then snake a breathing tube through. And that was how I would use it to intubate. So they brought in the patient, we put on the stethoscope, I put my hand over their, their mouth to, to bag them and mask ventilate them. Uh, and then we, I put in the, the ET tube uh, and then I heard the boop, 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 which meant the patient was breathing. And then I had to stop and take a breath myself uh, because I successfully done it. But by putting these things together and relocating the uncertainty, it, it, we'll figure out how to do this. It's, you know, that's how we, we achieved this goal. So in this process, uh, you know, we learn about the students and we learn about ourselves and, and just the nature of learning in general. Uh, and the student becomes the, the collaborator, not just the, you know, the, the vessel we're filling with knowledge, right? Um, and I sort of paraphrase the, the old saying in a little different way. When the teacher is ready, the competent student will appear. When we're ready to, to participate in this learning, the, the student will be there. So I'll give you an example from my life that I think illustrates uh, several of these concepts. Um, so the question is how, so um, images of protein structure are often used in you know, large colored balls or overlapping frames and spheres, and, and it, it can be a, a complicated uh, appearing image. So how could a blind person see protein structure, right? It's a good question. I was in grad school uh, and had to answer this question for myself. The first thing we need to do is, is check our assumptions. Um, the atomic structure of a protein is actually smaller than the wavelength of light that you could use to look at it. So it turns out nobody sees protein structures. Uh, what people see are common representations of protein structures used using visual imagery. That visual image is no more valid than, than other ways you could represent it. Uh, it's just the common way that uh, a lot of folks who happen to have sight do it. So once we started with that, well, we needed to back up and say, well, what do we really need to do? Well, we need a way to appreciate the distances between atoms, check. We need a way to understand some spatial relationships, and we need to a way to use a tool in near real time. So we, we can't, you know, spend hours or days in, in developing this um, on multiple structures. So, so what could we do? Well, we take a look at our survey. We look what's in our what's in our toolkit. What was in my toolkit at the time? Um, so we have technology, we have computing resources. 
there's publicly available routines to, to put together uh, graphics and um, protein modeling images. Uh, I had the support of my supervisor, uh, Katrina Forrest, and this is important. I, I couldn't have done this without, without her backing and collaboration. Um, you know, and I had some techniques and skills. I had auditory spatial abilities. I had some musical experience. Um, I had a short-lived stint in a band in high school. Um, and I had some programming experience. So these days, if we were to face this problem again, it might be different. We might be able to 3D print uh, simply, relatively simply and easily make models. This might look a little differently now, but these are the tools we had uh, at the time. So what we decided is we would make uh, a program, a friend suggested I call it Tim Mole, um, text interface to macromolecules. Um, so what you do is you essentially scroll through 3D space excuse me, of a protein with a selection sphere. And then the text output, which can be read in Braille or, or speech, etc., will describe what's in the circle or what's in the sphere. So as you imagine scrolling through an Excel spreadsheet, cell by cell and reading what's in each cell, you're just doing the same thing in three dimensions uh, with, with this program. And it'll tell you what's, you know, what's in the spot, and then you can sort of use it to, to make queries and understand how close and what things are related in space. So that was a good start. But then we said, well, you know, we really could do something more to enhance the, the spatial sense. So we added some auditory functions uh, that plays tones to indicate the atom's uh, location and identity. For example, a, you know, an, an organ might represent oxygen, uh, carbon might be a piano. Um, and then we said, well, let's use the left and right ear for X axis. Uh, y axis would be pitch and Z axis would be uh, softer and louder as if it's coming towards you or away from you. Uh, we even added hi hats to sort of tell you when you're moving, if you're going to the left or right as a, as a quick cue, if it was subtle and hard to distinguish. Um, so that was interesting. And then this is, this is a picture of what Timmel output might look like, kind of like a, a spider web sphere with, with, um, Adam representing spheres inside it. Uh, I found a collaborator, uh, named Britt Carlson and her, one of her goals was to uh, go into education and teaching. And so we had this idea that this tool could be useful, not just for me or, or, or potentially folks with, with visual impairments, but it could be more useful to, to folks in general. So she helped me develop the, the program, including this graphic interface that lets uh, a person typically used to viewing sighted uh, information understand what the, uh, what, what Timmel was, was playing and quote unquote looking at. Um, so if we're lucky here, I'll give you a quick, quick video of Tim Mole in action. So I need to enable sound sharing. Now you will hear my speech synthesizer briefly. So I will turn that off as soon as possible, but we'll also give you a sense of what I'm hearing right now. Um, so we'll go back here. Leaving menus, PowerPoint, slideshow, dash up, top four, final, dot, PPTX. Ready, video, 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 virtual PC, virtual slide 27, dash Tim Mole, video, video, video. Right. Slide 27, video, video, video. So here's, the, uh, here's Tim, uh, an example of Tim Mole in action. It's playing its way through an alpha helix, which is a common structure uh, in, in protein uh, chemistry. So you'll, you'll hear the rising tones as they move across, uh, sort of cyclically rising and falling as it, as it spirals. Um, unfortunately, because of how we recorded, I did, didn't get the stereo data, but I think this will give you a general sense. So let me get my audio back here. More button drop down. Space. Pause recording. Leave. Alt. Meeting info. Turn on original sound. Stereo left there. Not. Mono check. Optimize for video. Oops. Mono. Stick. Turn on original. Meeting info. Leave. Alt. Pause. Rec Stop recording. Alt. Show sub. View full track. Subtitle settings. Bring up reactions. Disable and hide names of edits. Remote control. Hide video. Hide floating. Share sound. Check. And All right. So 
we actually did a, a small study uh, with with folks who were in the the protein sciences and had them turn off the graphic displays and folks were able to identify structures such as uh, alpha helices um, there's a thing called a beta sheet and a loop uh, with using just these sound cues after a little bit of training so this type of thing uh, certainly uh, could be useful for folks not just folks with um, with visual impairments uh, these days i'm gratified you know when i open my iphone i can check the precipitation chart or even the stocks and and uh, ios now uh, uses audio cues to convey graphic information in a 2d sense so it's neat to see these these concepts um, generalizing so hold on a sec here my speech and i think the slides are out of sync here hold on folks all right so when folks are given a chance and with collaboration and awareness of, of our biases and you know the ability to to utilize skills towards a well-defined goal you know students with disabilities can overcome a variety of educational hurdles right this this is the traditional sense we know we know this uh, intuitively right um but every approach has its strengths and has its weaknesses right what what are the shortcomings of this hurdle approach um so you can get sidetracked with the obstacle and, and forget about the the actual the learning goal um and there's argument that it's less efficient for mass education um, and individuals just they, they may have their own barriers uh, for seeking accommodation um, so you know the individual might not even know there's resources or know where to look uh, they might have had past experiences that leave them with frustrations about the systems you know we've all probably had some frustrations with systems in our lives um, you know they wish to not have the problem and, and maybe if they just don't don't engage, you know, that, that helps them with that process, at least temporarily. Um, they wish they didn't have to ask for help. And, you know, there's the thought that, well, if I, if I ask for help, will this somehow um, disclosure, delegitimize what I've, what I've learned, what I'm doing? Uh, and there's, there's stigma. Um, or the disability itself gets in the way. You know, for example, like a, a, a problem with mental health. And these, many of these are identified in, in surveys of college age youth. Um, so, so I, I see, uh, young adults with various mental health problems. Um, and, and as, when these present as disabilities, they're, they're inv invisible. Uh, you know, we can only see the, the shadow they cast sometimes, uh, and they can interfere with the typical processes of accommodation. Um, and we're seeing the, the effect, not the cause. So. You know, if someone's highly anxious, uh, that's a barrier to their participation in, in class. So we see someone who never speaks up uh, or looks unprepared when you call on them, right? Um, someone who has depression, which often uh, overlaps with low motivation. We see someone who's, you know, not showing up to class or struggling with their assignments. Um, and so I tend to, when possible, think of the, the saying, fix the problem, not, not the blame. Uh, the, our biases on these can can run deep uh because we don't see the you know we we don't see the the wheelchair or the cane or the seeing eye dog uh, so it's we need to be especially careful here but why is this important well this this is from a google search uh mainly uh so um you know a variety of you know very famous successful uh important folks you know for example have struggled with with mental illness, um, you know, Beethoven, uh, I assume a music program might want to have him or Churchill in, in political science or Isaac Newton, uh, perhaps in a physics program, right? And even Beethoven later in life uh, had problems with hearing, hearing impairment. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a correlation uh, potentially between bipolar disorder and creativity. Um, Ernest Hemingway, Virginia Woolf, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, again, folks who struggled with these problems, but also 
made tremendous contributions. Um, and then, you know, folks in the, the visual and film industries, uh, Walt Disney, Steven Spielberg, Whoopi Goldberg, you know, and I think maybe, you know, the economics department certainly could work with Charles Schwab, um, and Richard Branson. So it's, you know, these folks have challenges, often in invisible, um, but also potentially have a lot they can contribute. So uh, this, this is uh, mandatory in many places, the, the COVID-19 slide. Uh, so students, you know, arriving at university now have had very different lives than, than many of us who attended university previously. Um, potentially less structured social interaction in school. Um, they've had challenges with online coursework. Uh, you know, maybe even they missed some typical rituals of adolescence and adulthood, or, or they were different. Um, and they had the additional pandemic associated stresses. So these folks may be more prevalent uh, in the, the university population now more than more than ever. So currently, um, I work as a a psychiatrist at a university with around 40,000 students. Um, it's interesting to note when we think about barriers, when I went to hire for the job, uh, I was interviewing uh, one of the head folks and I said, aren't you going to ask me how I'm going to do blah, blah, blah. Uh, and she said, no, no, we, we get it. We, we know you, you can handle this now. And so it was nice to know that there are points in, in, in situations where the disability and the hurdle um, does not take center stage. Um, so I've seen students uh, succeed with all these um, problems and more. You know, young people are in a learning space. They're ready to grow and adapt. Their brains have not finished maturing. Uh, and they're often highly motivated. Um, so, you know, we can, we can tap into that. And that's why we, we need to do that um, by building, building highways. Um, so I believe this is a picture of a highway, an outdoor scene. Uh, so we go from hurdles to, to highways. So highways that convey people safely, quickly, uh, the, the majority of folks towards uh, the learning goals. So I, I saw, I peeked ahead, I think tomorrow at noon, there's a talk on universal design. Um, I think that would be, be really awesome. Uh, well, there's a lot of great talks, but I did see that on the, on the agenda too. Um, but universal design, and th there are different subgenres. Uni universal design for learning. I, I intend to talk about this in more the the broader context. Um, uh, so, so what's the goal? The goal is to uh, to design the best for the most. Um, so you want to have information in um, different formats, course materials. You want to have clear and comprehensive uh, expectations. You know, that makes sense. Um, potentially choices and ways of learning and how to present what you've learned and the environment. Um, you know, minimize the physical barriers and components to, to learning, the, the challenges at that level. Uh, you want to have a course space that's, that's physically accessible uh, and you want to support respectful communication among learners like we had with the, those intention statements uh, before this seminar. And so you want to create an environment that improves learning for disabled and non-disabled folks. And a lot of times collaboration is, is a handy way to do that because everyone has their own strengths. And when you put folks together, we naturally uh, tend to work in ways that, that can optimize strengths. Um, so what are, what are some ideas? Um, so you begin with the goal in mind, you, you know, why are, why are we teaching this? What's the core, um, you know, where, where are we going with this and how does the, the task relate to it? Um, so if the goal is to show mastery, can you give people opportunities to, to write versus present, um, things like that? Um, is it important that people um, dispense their knowledge at a high rate or can you give them time you know, to take home tests or, or uh, do tests with where time is not the pressure. Um, you know, I see students whose focus or wakefulness varies throughout the day. Um, so can students have, you know, testing at different times a day to, to optimize how, how they learn and work best? Um, 
another neat uh, concept is the flipped classroom. I've seen some really interesting work on this, um, where students engage with the learning activity, not just watch a video of a lecture, but engage with the learning activity and then come to class to work on something collaboratively. Um, I've seen, you know, um, publications where this has been done in, you know, 1200 student engineering courses. Um, it's a pretty fascinating uh, way to, to build in some inherent yeah, inclusivity. So, you know, these are, these are complementary processes. Um, I'll give you an example. When I went to work uh, at uh, University of Wisconsin, I called the company who makes the medical record software, uh, point and click, uh, and I, I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a blind person, I'm interested in, in this. Um, and I, I wound up uh, working for the company and they told me, you know, we're, we're building from the ground up a, a web platform and we want it to be accessible. We want to build it right um, from the ground up and would you be involved in that effort? So these things happen collaboratively out in the world. You, you sort of have to, have to tap into them. Um, and these individual processes that we talked about with the hurdles and the group processes that we talked about uh, with the design can happen simultaneously. Uh, and there's common components. You know, we, we need to be aware of our assumptions. Uh, we need to tap into the, um, the available tools. Uh, we need to focus on the, the goal at hand, right? Um, and the more we build universe, this is, this is the cool part. The more we build universally, uh, the less individual accommodation may be needed, but it also frees up the bandwidth so that we can help with the hurdles when they approach. So if you can get 80% of your students, 85, whatever, cruising with these universal techniques, that, that frees up uh, energy and time uh, to help the individuals with the, the individual hurdles. So iteration is expected. Success is not final, and failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts, from Winston Churchill. Uh, we don't have to get it completely right the first time, and we won't. Um, but in these, these ways, faculty, teachers, leaders can be models of continual growth, right? So we hold ourselves accountable, we collaborate, and we share what we've learned. So in doing this, you know, it's not just what we're delivering that is teaching, it's, it's we're the message. It's how we, how we demonstrate these processes um, as, as leaders. So just a final pearl, um, you know, an oyster starts by facing an initial challenge, a, a different, something that, that chafes, that seems, seems odd. Um, you know, is that, is that a unique student with an educational challenge? And then you have the educator uh, seeking to, to teach for all, right? With time, care, and iterative smoothing, right? The grain of sand and the pearl or in the oyster becomes the pearl, right? So it's through this iterative process of adapting to, to challenge and smoothing and highway building uh, that, that we build, right? And this can be the story of education for all, including, including those folks with disabilities. So that's my, those are my thoughts. Uh, thanks for your time, and I will be happy to uh, participate in the Q&A shortly. Uh, I, along with a couple of other folks, are moderating the question and answer period. So Jillian or Sue, do you have any on Slido? We do. We have a, a few questions coming through, and some are, are getting some votes up, so I'll read the the, uh, the top question right now. Over the past several years, we have seen more opportunities for online learning. From your perspective, are there more or less hurdles introduced as the mode of instruction shifts to online settings? Okay. Um, it's a great question. Uh, I guess I will build an analogy. Um, when I was in the hospital learning to be a physician, uh, all our charts were on paper, uh, often handwritten, and that was not easy for a, a, a blind student. Um, and then I said to myself, when this goes electronic, it's all going to get better. 
Uh, and that was partially true, but when things change formats or go electronic, is uh, often it create it can create other barriers. Uh, so I can't say globally it's a it's an improvement. I think for some it's better. Um, you know, for example, I see folks with significant social anxiety who love uh, the online format. Um, you know, for folks with with visual impairments, sometimes um, figuring figuring out the contents of slides and Things like that can be a challenge. I know it's also can be challenging for folks uh, who want to read lips uh, um, and things like that. So I, I think it's a mixed, like most things, I think it's a mixed bag, but most mixed bags have opportunities built in. Great, thank you. Still don't see any hands up, so we can go to another question from Slido. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, this question is sort of teaching related. Uh, something that comes up in discussions of inclusive and accessible teaching is that it requires extra effort and strains the instructor's already limited time and resources. How do you address that kind of response to inclusive teaching? That's a great question. I mean, there are so many stresses on instructors' time and resources already. Like, I, I tell I hear that as a concern. Um, I think it, it can be that it may be um, investment now with payoff later if, if you're, you know, for example, designing universally or changing things to make them uh, um, more accessible in the future. So I think I think there may be an increased workload temporarily, but I think it, it certainly could pay dividends in the long run. That's I, I guess encourage people to to try to take the long view when they can. Keep chilling, we'll keep going. Okay. Uh, the next question: How do you find out if people need a highway? How can you offer these supports or how do you advertise that extra supports are available? Um, thinking of folks who may not realize they're available or know how to ask for them. Right, exactly. And that's the beauty of the highway. So, so in this metaphor, that should be sort of built into the course. So, so the course is designed in a way, you know, in an auditorium that you can, you can get to mobility-wise challenges, braille labels on the door, you know, where, um, information's available, those sort of things that so so the idea is to build the highway into the class design so the student doesn't necessarily have to ask for it. Um, and, and that's that's the universal and universal design uh, approach. Can I ask a quick follow up? Sorry. Sure. <laughs> it's Christina. Yeah. Um, so if I'm thinking about the highway um, and uh, I, I just was thinking about some specific things I might do for students who are visually impaired or blind or those with mental health um, uh, uh, challenges. So like just what are a couple things that might be particularly impactful? Yeah, so just like the so the the course materials, like how are they, you know, how are they accessible? Is it, you know, is, is there an accessible web page? Um, you know, can they, can folks get to them in a, in a way that that's meaningful using, you know, braille, enlargement, uh, whatever, um, or is the, you know, are, are the recorded lectures in a way that someone who's hard hearing, uh, or deaf could, could access. So it's sort of building it from the, from the ground up with, with those approaches. All right. Thanks. Sure. And just a reminder, you can also uh, use the raised hand function in Zoom and speak on the mic if you choose, but you also could use Slido instead. Oh, somebody's going to speak up, right? Maybe. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll keep going with Slido. There's great questions on here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there is a hand up. OK, Laura. Please go ahead. There we go. Good morning. Hi. Um, my name is Laura. Um, I go by she and her. I'm a uh, white woman um, sitting in an office. Um, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you coming to share this morning. Uh, so my, some of my involvement in uh, teaching and learning here at UBC uh, is that I work with 
uh, health professional students who are disabled folks, folks with disabilities, um, and chronic physical and mental health conditions at the Center for Accessibility. Um, so I guess I, well, for one thing, I wanted to have someone speak because sometimes it just takes one person to <laughs> uh, break that ice. Um, and I, but my question for you is I would love to just hear a little bit more about how you navigated um, kind of some of the hidden curriculum in medicine around what a physician or what a health professional uh, looks like, is like, um, and, and yeah, kind of some of those challenging hidden curriculum pieces um, and some of that stigma. Um, yeah, some of those, those I find for a lot of the health professional students as well as health professionals I work with and as a, a blind person myself, um, some of the most challenging hurdles um, are those ones that are microaggressions and et cetera, et cetera, that are very hard to pinpoint. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just curious what your experience. Sure, sure. And to be honest with you, I wish they were all microaggressions. <laughs> so, <laughs> just like Russian aggression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, well, the first thing is at the University of Wisconsin, I had a very good experience and on the whole, the institution was really supportive. And I think that makes a difference if there's, um, you know, if, if that's there. Uh, so one of our first tasks as a, as a medical student in the hospital is to go in and, and interview a patient. Um, so these patients, you know, they, they're in the hospital for various reasons. Someone comes around in the morning and says, hey, would, you know, there's a med student who wants to talk to you. Would you mind talking with, with Johnny, you know? And so they, they did that. And, and my friend uh, Dan and I went, went to the hospital and said, hey, you yeah, know, let's, let's go do it. Um, so I walk in uh, to the room with my uh, short white coat and my German Shepherd. Uh, and the patient promptly says, I never said I could have a med student. You know, what are you doing here? And, and so it was like, mm, I have a feeling that, you know, was not about. Uh, so, so those things happen and, and, uh, you know, the best, sometimes the best you can do is shrug it off. Um, and, and just keep, just keep moving ahead. Um, cause the, you know, there are, there are folks like that. I'll tell you this though. I, um, I moved in, uh, you know, my wife and I bought a, bought a house. And it turns out across the street from us is a uh, physician who was on the admission panel when I came to uh, the University of Wisconsin. Um, he, he's become a friend of mine, uh, but he said, you know, when you got in, I didn't think you could make it, but I was wrong, you know? And so you sort of have to leave room for people to, to recalibrate and, and save face too. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it. I, I think you, you try to walk the walk, you, you, you know, you, you model and copy what you can. Uh, you shrug off what what you can't, um, and and those are sort of my my general general strategies. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Laura, for speaking up. Uh, Jillian, go to the next Slido question. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a question about, uh, I guess, system structures and mental health. Do you think COVID-19 mental health issues overpower and strain a disability system that is not matured yet? Uh, those with visual or other phys physical disabilities still don't have access to software such as the IMML. Can you, can you guys help me out with the IMML? I'm not sure what oh, okay. that is. Is anyone... Was it the is uh, is it the one that you were describing, Tim? I'm assuming they mean the Timol. Oh, Timol, yeah, the, probably. Oh, that's okay. My guess. Yeah. Well, so so as far as Timol goes, I published on it and have the source code. So if anybody wants to uh, work with it, like that's freely available. Um, it, it's it runs in Perl, which is kind of an older language, but it is it is workable. Um, so. Yeah, I think, you know, COVID-19 strained a lot of systems. And, and I think um, those that help folks with disabilities, uh, to me, matured implies like the job's done. Uh, and I think it's going to be a long time before the job's done. And, and so I think they're maturing. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of strain on resources and, and folks, you know, they're, they're 
you know, certainly places where people don't, um, you know, don't have what they need yet. And, and that's why we, you know, we, we talk about this stuff and put it front and center and celebrate learning week, you know, as a, as a, a place to reorient focus and start. Go to the next question, Julie. This is a, a question about your 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 own experience, Tim. Mm -hmm. What inner resources and external resources have you tapped into through your and early career to develop your inspiring possibilities mindset? Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'll write a book someday. Uh, but you know, it started out. I um, my parents were wonderful. Uh, well, are wonderful. Um, they, they were wonderful to me growing up. My father, engineer, uh, you know, get the job done, Tim, let's solve the problem. Uh, and my mother um, was a social worker when I was very young and had the, the emotional, um, you know, social emotional support. Uh, I had those two. And then I had my older sisters who wouldn't let me slack off, who, who wouldn't let me get out of chores because I couldn't, couldn't see, for example. When they were mowing the lawn, I was hand clipping around the house, the, the weeds. Um, because they, they wouldn't let me slack off. Um, so I think those things mattered a lot. I've, I've had the good fortune to run into a lot of wonderful people, uh, make some good friends uh, along the way and couldn't have done a lot of this without them. You know, luck. Uh, Pasteur says chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, and I've certainly had a lot of lucky chances and hopefully I've been prepared enough to take advantage of some of them. So I think that's sort of my, my general. I do acknowledge, you know, that I've, I've been very lucky too. So, just another invitation for anyone who wants to to raise their hand and speak. But barring that, we have some more excellent questions on the slide up. All right, the next question that's bubbled to the top. Writing effective alternative text for images is something I find challenging. Do you have any advice for approaching writing alt text in an effective way or, or is there a resource that you can recommend? Oh man, that's a good question. So I don't have a good resource off, offhand. I think, um, so there was a, um, a, a clerk who would work in our front desk and he would send out pictures. Um, of his you know cats or animals or doing doing fun things and it turns out he was he was alt text captioning for me specifically i think because he knew i was the only person who would, who would read these emails among the mass audience and he was so good at it and i think the thing that that made him good at it was that he tried to you know say to himself what would i want to know or you know it's, it's like the begin with the goal in mind what's what's the core thing that that people ought to take from this and then working backwards or it's maybe like writing a news article, you, you put the headline first. So I think it's kind of that idea. I know there is better and better automated um, attempts to do alt text or image, excuse me, image descriptions, which can be a, a backup. But yeah, it's, it's a challenge and I appreciate folks who do it. It's, it's really neat. Thank you. Uh, I see a hand up from Wei Chiao. Hi, my name is Wei Chow. Um, you should hear her pronouns. I'm actually Dr. Portis's co-worker. I'm really grateful that he allowed me to, to join his talk. Um, and this is, and Tim and I had conversation often um, at clinical settings, so we talk about cases, but, but this is more of a personal question for you. Um, and, and then for me, I, I guess, <clears throat> Big question, have you ever had doubt, um, self-doubt um, about what you could achieve or what you want to achieve? Um, and I ask that question because when I'm thinking about students that we're working with, um, I'm a mental health provider. Um, students have a lot of self-doubt and sometimes I have you know, we, we could do our best. And I used to be a special education teacher. So we could have all the good intention. We could try very hard to um, hope that we could support students to succeed and really um, reach their you know, potential. And 
and and and yet there's students self doubt and versus sometimes there are so many barriers in the systems that teachers or mental health providers ourselves have doubts are we I don't know if I'm always confident and to be able to say, hey, hanging there, you'll be able to make it someday. And, and so I guess, you know, the question of how do you manage that? What, what keeps you going? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. So, so I'll, uh, I'll give you a story. So I, I was applying to medical schools. Uh, I applied to, I don't know, a dozen. Uh, I, I went on interviews, um, you know, got a lot of rejections. There was actually one school, we, we talk about uh, microaggressions or whatever. Uh, I finished the whole interview day uh, for various reasons. I probably should have been a shoe in for the school. And they, they brought me in a back room with, with a couple other faculty and said, you know, regardless of how good your application is, you're not going to be a, a med student here. Um, and so those things were all piling up. And, and I, I think I had maybe one application out left to the University of Wisconsin. And I was actually going, I just said, well, if I can't do this, I'm going to be a, a DJ in Alaska. Uh, so I was reading my demo tape, uh, preparing that uh, in my friend's room uh, when the call came in for the University of Wisconsin uh, to say, hey, you know, why don't you, why don't you come in and join our program? So it, things could have gone differently and I could have you know, been a, a DJ in Alaska uh because yeah you know these these things happen and you know we're human beings moving forward times proceeding uh sometimes you know when do we change course and that's a that's a tough one um so like my my failing is sticking too long uh you know at, at, at things and you know maybe when i should have changed course sooner and, and we all we all have to walk that balance and it's really hard to know for somebody else so, so when I get in that position, I, I give folks the benefit of the doubt because I say what I've wanted somebody, you know, say no to me, what I want, you know, and, and so I, I sort of flip it that way. So yeah, sure, I've, I've had my share of doubts um, and, you know, and, and so I, but I do think that's, it's a real, it's a real challenge and you're right. Sometimes it's worth hanging in there and sometimes you need to, you need to change course. My, my friend had a poster of um, Albert Einstein playing basketball and, and and it said if it weren't for a tragic ankle injur injury, we never would have had the physics genius we we appreciated. Um, and so I think I think it's really interesting to think along those lines. Thank you. I wanted to note that there are a couple of resources being shared in the chat. So thanks to folks who are sharing those resources with our um, uh, moderators. So one is from Harvard about uh, Harvard University Digital Accessibility, about writing good alt text to describe images. Another one is uh, from the Diagram Center, diagramcenter.org, also image description dialogue. Uh, guidelines, image description guidelines. So we've got a couple of things being shared in the chat. So thank you very much for this, those. This is awesome, right? This is what happens when you bring people together, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. So keep them coming. <laughs> so if people want to share uh, information, um, please send it to either Jillian Gerhardt or Sue Hampton, both with the Q and A after their um, participants, or put it into Slido. That works too. Jillian, next question. Uh, we have a. Just a comment first, uh, which is just the, the quote, uh, nobody sees the protein structure, end quote, is a prompt that will stay with me. Thanks. <laughs> sure. And then we have, we have a, a question from a student who's asking you, uh, what advice would you give to prospective grad students with one or more Fs on their transcripts resulting from under-supported mental health crises during previous academic study? So the student says, I have the supports I need now, but I have Fs on record. That is that that's challenging. Um, you know, sometimes you if you could make a, a connection with somebody in the field or the topic that the F was in that says, you know, I'm aware of this student's challenges and now it seems like they're, you know, able to do organic chemistry or, you know, like you certainly could go that route. Um, sometimes, you know, input from mental health providers, we can at our university help folks with, you know, withdraw from a course or you know um that sort of thing but yeah it, that's a it's a real it's a real challenge and sometimes people go on to you know uh master's programs or things to sort of whip up their, their grades to boost 
um, qualifications. But I'm glad things are better now. But that is a that is a real challenge. Thank you. Uh, there's something in the chat. I'm going to look up, and then I'll I'll talk about it in a moment. So, Jillian, if you want to go ahead with the next question. Certainly, uh, one of our one of our other students uh, has has also uh, just messaged that for that student, uh, you may be able to apply for special consideration on disability related grounds if you're oh. applying to UBC grad studies. Oh, cool! And uh, thank you, Laura, for that comment. Uh, so the next question uh, is: You talk about the importance for educators of doing the work on our own biases. Do you have any suggestions for addressing ableism in the classroom to ensure that students with a visible and invisible disabilities experience a safe and supportive learning environment during group work, etc.? So helping students to address their own biases. That's a good one. Um, so, so one exercise I, I've done in other talks, which just as an example, um, I, I've taught about the, the photonically dependent folks. Is, is a way that, that blind people can think of, of uh, folks who are sighted and just sort of thinking of all the things in the world that, that are built for, for that use case, you know, computer monitors, light bulbs, uh, colored clothing, and just sort of, you know, potentially from, from any given perspective, think about what's, you know, think of barriers or challenges or how that person might uh, conceive things differently. Certainly you could, direct towards uh, resources about people with disabilities to sort of give give them a ways to look at, at that angle. Um, but I think it's it's really just that ability to start to take a step back and, and see see your own lens. And, and it's not just disability, you know, it's 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 gender, it's ethnicity, it's it's all those things. Um, and that's work we're all doing in, in various levels. So um, there was a suggestion in the chat, which I looked up to um, uh, look at Vocal Eye, uh, which is a local Vancouver organization. Um, and I put the uh, uh, website into the chat. It's simply www.vocaleye.ca. And it's a nonprofit society. They do live description of arts uh, for blind people in Canada. So they provide greater access to theater, arts, and cultural events for people of all ages who are blind and partially, partially sighted. And um, so it's, I haven't had a chance to really look through it carefully, but it sounds like they um, provide uh, auditory descriptions of uh, arts events, so. Yeah, our, I went to our, our local theater uh, like a, this past year and, and some, the guy at the counter is like, oh, you know, we have, if you call us ahead of time for certain certain uh, plays, we, we have a describer who will, you know, sit in the back and tell you what's going on. It's, it's amazing, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that sounds like that's what they do. Yeah. yeah. So it's great. Thank you to whoever shared that. No hands up. So let's keep going with the Slido. Hi, okay, this is a, a question from uh, Jennifer Gagnon, who said, I'm a disabled instructor. What are your thoughts about bringing your disabled identity to classroom? I disclose to my students, most reactions are positive, but some are negative. How can being open about disabled identity enhance learning and what are the risks in doing so? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so I face this a little differently. Um, you know, as a psychiatrist, I always, if I'm bringing my identity in, I'm asking myself, what is this doing for, in, this, in my case, for the patient? You know, so I think in the classroom, maybe what what is this doing potentially for the learning experience of the students? So I think first of all, you know, being able to answer that that question, um, I I think is is helpful. Uh, what are the risks? The risks are you're putting yourself out there, right? Um, you know, <laughs> you just look at Twitter, right? Someone has a good idea, and you know, fifteen percent of people think it's terrible, right? So so you're you know, it takes it takes a lot. It takes a lot of courage. So I give you, you know, I give you credit for that, but it does, you know, so I think the, what are the risks? The risks are that, um, you know, you're going to have to deal with stuff that, you know, maybe people shouldn't have to deal with, or you're going to, you're going to get pushed back. Uh, and so you have to decide, you know, is it, is it worth it? And, and then it circles back to how is this helping the learning? And, you know, are you able to, to ride that wave? And I think if, if you think it's helping the learning and you could ride the wave, then there's probably, you know, significant value in it. Because I think, um, 
you know, I've transitioned from being the, the student who squeaked in uh, to medical school to, to training people. You know, I actually have a fellow this year uh, who rotated with me uh, back in the day as a medical student. Um, and so he's seen, you know, hey, there's, you know, there's blind folks doing medicine, there's teaching, training. Um, so I think the more people can see disability out there, that this is, this is just how we are, you know, this is, this is our story. Um, like, I think ultimately that has value, but I also know that it does, it can certainly have, um, have costs too. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to raise a hand to speak? And if not, we can keep going, Jillian, with the mm -hmm. Q and A's. Uh, we have a question. Sarah Nitter, who is the co-director of the Center for Accessibility at UBC, has asked, can you describe some other ways you engage in clinical rotations, like the, the intubation example? Oh, OK. Um, so uh, for so one another uh, challenging task is interpreting x-rays. Uh, so in that case, I used an old device. Um, it's called an Opticon. Uh, the one I use is actually older than me. Um, so what it has is a postage stamp size camera that you slide across the page uh, and it's connected to a vibrating pin display. Uh, and so you can sort of feel the, the original intent was to have people read print with it. And there are people who can do that pretty, pretty well. I'm not super efficient at that. Um, but what I used it for is I could, I could adjust the threshold and then feel the, the ribs and the space, you know, I'd say a chest x-ray and see if there's, you know, extra, extra space or mass or so I, or a broken bone. Um, so I would use it in, in things like that. Um, most of the physical exam uh, can be modified uh, to, to be done with touch. The, the testing the cranial nerves, which I commonly do, you know, heart, lungs, no big deal. Uh, watching gait, you can sort of put your hands on somebody uh, and feel them move. Um, those sort of things. There were for very specific things. Uh, I would, you know, work with a, a nurse and say, "Could you, you know, describe what you see in the in the throat?" We, you know, and, and I would interpret the information, but they would help gather it. Um, you know, likewise with rashes, often you can feel the rash as well. Um, so those were sort of the 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 kinds of things that I would do in the uh, in the clinical space. so much. And wonderful, we've got uh, someone raising their hand. Alexa, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Hi. sorry, my, my voice is a little off. I think I might have to get a COVID test. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I like I'm a, a grad student, like working in a physical lab. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of always thinking like, wow, this is not very accessible to people who, you know, don't have sight or hearing mm -hmm. or have mobility impairments and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering, I don't know, like if you know um, if there's been like work done or like solutions, like I often think like in tissue culture, I'm like if I was in a wheelchair oh, yeah. and if I had to move and then I had to touch my dirty wheelchair with my sterile gloves and like then having to you know yeah or like if I was visually impaired like how I would be able to manipulate this stuff precisely to mm -hmm. prevent contamination and just like yeah just like how everything's kind of not really built I mean like yeah like it, it hasn't it hasn't really changed in decades right like how labs are yeah yeah uh <laughs> So, so I'm not sure where he's at right now, but um, Kerry Sapala, uh, he, he, I think the last I saw he was at either Illinois University or, or maybe Purdue, um, but he, he had this thing called the iLab project. And it was a project, uh, it was also at the high school and, and, and college level, but uh, modifying lab equipment uh to be helpful and then i think as a, as a start for folks with uh with visual disabilities so you know talking um um uh you know spectrometers and um you know scales and things like that which was a, a really you know a good a good start and approach so i think that um yeah th there's a lot of issues in in the physical lab that that are challenging 
you know, I, I back in the day, I, I think I hooked out, was it like a, a serial port on our scale to a, to a computer to see if I could, uh, you know, read the scale. And I had a, um, uh, a pipette, a uh, 1000 uh, mil pipette that you could dial in the, the amount, um, or you could, you know, you could s spin up just exactly halfway between top and bottom on a P20 or something. And so, so I, you know, there, there are various things, but it is, it is, uh, it is challenging. And this is the other space where people who do it um, don't always know to share what they've learned. And so building these informal networks of, um, of people who, who are doing these things are, are helpful because um, I'm aware of, you know, an, an, uh, other uh, blind folks who are doing, you know, say cell biology and, and things like that. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think like, you know, being able to share what we know uh, is super helpful too. Thank you so much, Alexa. That's, that's so helpful to hear, you know, yeah. the things that I, I don't work in a lab, so it, it just wasn't crossing my mind, but that's really helpful to know. Yeah. I'm seeing in the chat a resource being shared by a participant um, called, uh, it's from accessiblecampus.ca, accessiblecampus.ca, and it's called Creating an Accessible Science Laboratory Environment for Students with Disabilities. So it's a PDF. Um, from 2014. So there's uh, that being shared. There's also Docs with Disabilities podcast, stories from various health professionals with disabilities, docswithdisabilities.org. Oh, and they're coming quick now. There's another one. <laughs> Coalition for Disability Access in Health Science Education. That's hsmcoalition.org, Coalition for Disability Access in Health Science Education. Fantastic resources being shared, mm -hmm. everyone. Thank you. I've also just posted in the chat a question from a, a PhD student to the UBC community. Uh, so if people have responses and, and I'll, I'll post them back. Uh, this question is, is there an active support group for students on campus? Uh, the student began their PhD prior to the pandemic and wasn't able to connect with other students and would like to learn about opportunities uh, for ways to do that. So if anyone has any, any suggestions, please feel free to, to send them to me and I'll post them back into the chat for the student. Uh, and then for the next Slido question, if you want to take one more, I know we're running close to our end of time, but let me know, Christina. Yep, go ahead. As an employer supporting staff, I find it challenging to find a balance between flexibility and accountability. I found accountability to be a powerful way to support staff in finding, quote, the highway. Do you have any thoughts to share on this? Yeah, I, I you know, run a team right now and I, I agree. Um, I think, you know, as, as an employer or lead, I, I think if you build the culture of accountability, um, central and then allow the flexing around that to to achieve the the goal um i you know that's sort of how i approach it uh for example right now our, our university and we're still you know working on do we need to work from the office when we're seeing folks virtually things like that and so what we say is the accountability the core is you, you need to be a, a you know provider who sees patients and then we work with flexing around that uh, to to help people with their individual circumstances so I think it's it's once again sort of focusing on the core, and then building the flexibility in as ways to support people in in meeting that core accountability. But I agree, accountability is is critical too. So there's also something in the chat from uh, Sarah Nitter from the Center for Accessibility at UBC Vancouver. Uh, who says, regarding accessible labs, we will try to get an adjustable height desk, hire lab assistants, um, rent a standing wheelchair for an anatomy lab, dot, dot, dot. But yes, there is definitely a, a need for more physical accessibility mm -hmm. in labs. That's from our Center for Accessibility. Um, there's also, I'm hearing a grad student support group starting up soon, getting through grad school with Grace and Grit online support group, Tuesdays, May 17th to July 26th. 
2.30 to 3.45 p.m. So there's a link in the chat for a uh, sign up to register for the grad student support group. Actually, no, it's not there yet. Sorry, that's just to me. I will put it into the chat. My apologies. I think I'll just post it right now. Oh, do you have it too? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and we have a hand up by AJ. Please go ahead. Oh, hi there, my name is AJ and I'm one of hi. Uh, the advisors at the Center for Accessibility, and I work uh, a lot with the kind of the built environment in the last year. I was just going to add, just in case it's of interest for folks, is that um, for the like the provincial building codes, they're really particular to certain types of buildings. They didn't really cover labs very well, but the Rick Hansen Foundation has actually come up with guidance documents on how to make labs more accessible. They kind of did a scope of across the Canadian landscape, seeing what was happening with labs, and so that's been passed on to. Uh, facilities, campus planning, and folks for um, thinking about retrofitting labs or, or new labs. Thanks so much, AJ. That's really good to know. A couple of more things in the chat. Um, so uh, I did post information about the grad student support group uh, Tuesdays starting May 17th. So there's a very long URL in the chat, which I won't read out. It is very hard to read. <laughs> Um, if you're interested in registering for the grad student uh, support group. And then from Jennifer Gagnon, there's the Disabled Grad Students Group, as well as the Disability Affinity Group. And Jennifer is the chair of the Disability Affinity Group and would be happy to connect anyone with these groups. And she provides her email address, Jennifer with two N's, Gagnon, G-A-G-N-O-N, at ubc.ca. So I think we may have time for one more and then probably should uh, close out the session. I'm gonna go ahead, Jillian. Oh, you are muted. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Another question on hybrid learning. What are ways that the hybrid learning environments can be best leveraged for engaging equitably with students with disabilities, diverse needs and identities? For example, identifying as a person uh, disabilities who is also a woman of color. Yeah, that um, man, that, that's evolving so I so much. I don't. I, I think it's you know hybrid learning is is challenging because you know we're starting to understand that that you know Zoom and seeing yourself and and everything on the screen you know can can impact how people you know people's um emotions and, and all that and certainly i can see where um you know certain identities and things could be could also be impacted there so i i think you know we're, we're going to learn this hybrid learning i think it's you know just taking in as much as we can as, as teachers taking an, an equitable approach you know maybe even if possible you know seeing what what works for folks well you know what what do you what do you think in giving options i think those are you know choices um are powerful and i think sort of sitting those landscapes are probably the the things the places where I would start but I would also you know I've got myself a set of Google alerts and 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 how these things are evolving and um you know staying abreast of what once again you know we, we have such a community oh you, well you guys have such a community there uh, of folks who are who have ideas and, and knowledge and I think just just sharing what's working I think is, is so powerful especially as things are are evolving So I've just learned that we do actually have a bit of extra time. Um, if you're okay, Tim, to take sure. a couple more yeah. questions. Okay, I thought we were ending at 11.30, but we do have a bit of extra time. So um, yeah, uh, Jillian, there's been a couple of upvotes in a few of these lately, so. <laughs> Hi. Um, how can institutions move towards creating that highway that you talked about through policy in my structural ways yeah that's a great that's a great question um i tend to be a tactical guy more than a strategic guy so i don't you know i think just having a policy um and you know getting getting the right stakeholders and in in the room to sort of to craft something that says you know and, and it might even be simpler than that than just just a mission statement what do what do we believe and and where do we where do we start from um so i i guess i would say if you if you're going to craft a policy it's 
you want to make sure all the stakeholders are involved and and begin crafting it uh, collaboratively because it isn't going to work if it's it's not done collaboratively. And when you do that, you want to make sure if you can, you you have the resources and you know whether that's time or, or support uh, available to folks who are building the highway. Yeah, thanks. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, very recently in British Columbia. Um, well, there was an Accessible British Columbia Act that was passed a year or so ago, but very recently there's a new regulation that's applying it to post-secondary institutions. And one of the parts of that is to develop a disability commi committee, I think they're calling it, or an accessibility committee, um, where um, at least half of the folks and, and ideally more uh, should be people with disabilities so that you are involving the community if they're, you know, in whatever plans you make towards improving accessibility in the institution. Yeah. And I think the other thing that does is it, it offloads, you know, like you're letting the people with the expertise chime in so that the, you know, the educator doesn't have to be the expert in, in accessibility. And I think that collaboration is just like so powerful. Thanks, I see a hand up from Mike. Good afternoon. Um, Hi. I, your your comment about the the uh, BC Accessibility Act is UBC establishing such a committee? Do you know? Um, because I, I'm a person with a disability. I'm learning disabled, and I have fought all my life just to get accepted in any institution. Um, UBC is not the best place for us. If I want support, I have to go to the Accessibility Center with my documentation, and I have to go begging an instructor to. Uh, to support me in some way. So I would really like to know, is there some way of connecting with that? Is there this group going on? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm angry. <laughs> okay. No, that is perfectly fine. Thank you so much for your comment. It sounds very frustrating. Um, this regulation just came into to effect, was just publicized a couple of weeks ago. So as far as I know, there is no such committee yet, but I believe that post-secondary institutions will be required to have one. Um, and I can't remember exactly by when. <laughs> so that doesn't help you right now, um, but um, uh, you know something will be happening in the future. So thanks for your comment. I apologize that it's been a difficult situation for you. Yeah. So we do. Shall we do one more, Jillian? Certainly. Uh, before we do, there was a, a question, a person who'd sent a, a direct message, I think, to Alyssa, perhaps about um, some employment opportunities. If you could just direct me, uh, DM me directly, I'll, I'll connect you up with uh, Sarah Knitter. Uh, or, and we can, or you can just email Sarah Knitter directly, uh, and she's more than happy to chat. So, uh, next question that's come up is, could you speak a bit about the different ways people treat slash respond to persons with physical slash physical, visible disabilities versus mental uh, invisible disabilities. More judgment and blame towards those with invisible disabilities as if they should just try harder to overcome or that they are just weak. Yeah, yeah, that's, it, it, it's a big, it's a big difference. Um, you know, with, with physical uh, disabilities, I, you know, people, people do do, um, you know, they're interesting things. They. I think they fall into that, you know, could I uh, do that blank uh, bias, you know, one of the ones that always cracks me up is as a blind person when I'm walking along, uh, a sighted person might think they're helpful by stopping and being quiet, uh, which renders them invisible, uh, you know, and so, so people just do this kind of stuff automatically um, for folks with, with physical disabilities. With, with the, the more invisible disabilities, I think it's just it's it's harder for people to to wrap wrap their head around, and I think it's so commingled with their own personal experience. Um, you know, folks can, for example, close their eyes and have some transient idea of of what it's like not to see, um, but it doesn't you know give you the sense of what it's like for that to be chronic, for example. Um, but I think it's you know it's it's really hard to to understand a, a bipolar disorder or um a, you know a learning learning disability in that internal same way so i do think you're right i think there's you know the well just you know buckle down um push through uh with the the uh, more invisible disabilities and that's 
it's a real challenge. And I, like I say, I think it, I don't necessarily think it's intentional, but I think it taps into our own, our own biases and, and, and where we've come from and what we've struggled with or people in our lives have struggled with. Um, and so I, I agree, people do approach it differently. Um, and when people are comfortable to make the, you know, the, the invisible visible um, by sharing, you know, if, if they can handle that, I think that also that helps us helps us all. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts. Wow, thank you so much. There's there's um, been some things happening uh, in the chat, including someone thankfully pointing me to a link to the accessible BC legislation, which I've just posted into the chat, as well as uh, there's a new FAQ, um, frequently asked questions related to accessible BC. Uh, and this new, this particular regulation for organizations, including post-secondary uh, uh, institutions, to create disability committees and plans. So I've just added that link. So that's a link to the FAQ to talk about that. Um, so I've also got a question, uh, one last question from direct message. Someone says they their career ended prematurely and could not get back into their job. How would you approach it if you were in a similar position? Oh, that's a great question. Who's also a disabled person? Yeah, I think it really it really comes down to, um, you know, what what do you want to do? What resources? Where's your you know where's your heart? Where's your purpose? And and really you know what's you know what is available resource wise? And you know can you can you do something career adjacent? Can you you know is it there's there's a lot to unpack there but i think it you know it, it it comes down to those sort of core core questions okay i see bean is uh um, getting a hand in quickly right here at the end so if you've got a, a quick thought bean please go ahead yeah thank you thank you christina um i just had a comment i attended a session yesterday where students were sharing their feelings and their experiences as disabled students at ubc and one student really stuck with me that they talked about how they had suffer they suffer from ptsd and anxiety and their instructor was just met with them for an hour just to talk and that one hour of being able to talk with the instructor was was just life changing for them. And they really felt that that made a huge difference. It, you know, it took time on the instructor's part and especially right now with COVID, all the instructors are overwhelmed, but this made a huge difference to them and they've had more, much more successes because of that one conversation. So I just wanted to share that with other people to realize that, that taking an hour just to talk and it doesn't even have to be about the disability or the instance just to, get to know their instructor really can make an incredible change in their whole career at UBC. Great, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. You know, we, we can over, you know, policy and systematize things, but you're right that that human one to one contact, like, we, you know, we're, we're made to connect, like, you know, that's, that's how we how we work. So that's really awesome and, and powerful. And, and, you know, we shouldn't shy away from just being validating kind people you know and and so i, th I think that's great well thank you so much to everybody for your thoughts your comments the resources you've shared your questions thank you to tim for uh, patiently answering questions and having a conversation was there anything else you wanted to to end with tim no, I, I, I just I thank you all for for taking the time to participate in this and the, the work that you know there there is and in you know supporting each other and yeah no I, I just thank you so much for this opportunity. Enjoy thank your week. You. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so just a, a little bit more housekeeping and an announcement or two. So a follow up email will be sent to all of you at the end of the week, which will include a feedback survey as well as a link to the Celebrate Learning Week Wiki, which is where we're posting resources such as slides, videos, um, uh, and other kinds of resources for the sessions. So we've got a couple of other, oh, well, we've got many other events coming up in Celebrate Learning Week. We're just in day two. So there are many more things happening throughout the week. So um, tomorrow, May 11th, 
and these are all being put into the chat. There's an equity and inclusion scholars um, program panel, interventions towards inclusive teaching, that's tomorrow at 1030. We have a faculty and staff panel, teaching and learning accessible practices and support, that's tomorrow at 1.30 and a leadership panel with multiple leaders at the institution promoting access and inclusion for learners of all backgrounds at UBC. That's uh, May 12th, Thursday from 10 to 11.30. And if you want to see all of the Celebrate Learning Week events, please go to celebratelearning.ubc.ca uh, and you can uh, click on the events portion of the site. So thank you very much. Thank you again to Tim. Thank you for your uh, comments and your thoughts. Thank you to our live captioner and our ASL interpreters. Thank you to our moderators and to our event staff who made this run very smoothly. So I hope you have an excellent rest of your morning until it becomes afternoon very soon. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. <laughs>